Uh, we have a, a youth advisory uh, as part of our Fresno County Youth Court program. And uh, it's been in effect now, this is year two. And we made the decision this year that even though we're not actively doing uh, youth court cases, that we wanted to be sure this was an opportunity to really monitor our program and, and do some quality control. And so uh, our youth are now meeting uh, once a month along with our adult youth advisory. And um, so we've kind of been really talking a little bit about issues that youth are worried about. And so we came up with some questions uh, as a group. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be asking those questions and asking Lauren and Arlie and Nicole to respond and kind of give their perspective on their thoughts about that. Uh, we have a few other youth that are trying to join. We actually have a, a youth that's in England right now with a family emergency and she's been trying to come in and out. And so bear with us as we have people coming in. Um, we'll spend about the next 20 minutes just having, giving you an opportunity to hear from you. And then it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Jermaine Jackson uh, from Teaching Fellows, uh, who has a, a wonderful backstory and some, and, uh, uh, some perspective that uh, he will share based on the youth's perspective and, and some of his own experience. Uh, it's also my pleasure to have James White here, who is uh, with the California Health Collaborative. Uh, James and I have worked together now, what number of years um, uh, on some on projects related to youth. And, and uh, uh, I happened to share with him some of the concerns that youth had. And so he's going to kind of speak to that. So, um, so with that, and then I, uh, uh, Pam Hutton and uh, Adriana are also here from mm -hmm. Teaching Fellows and, and feel free to participate. Christina is here with uh, from Fresno Unified and, and uh, she is has a very prominent role in Fresno Unified in the restorative mm -hmm. practices area. Uh, and I wanna thank Christina because that her role along with Erica has helped us, I think, rethink youth court to have it become more of a restorative type of pr uh, process. Um, so, so with that, the, um, the first question that uh, we kind of played around with is, you know, what's, what are youth worrying about today? And, um, and so um, I'm gonna change, up, change it up a little bit. Um, uh, Nicole, I'm gonna let you go first. This was kind of your, your question. And then Lauren and um, Arlie, I'm gonna have you join in. So thoughts, what are youth worrying about today? Um, the youth are really worrying about like trying to like they're really trying to focus on their their, their grades because kids are worried about not graduating and like to me like if I if I'm because I'm struggling with my grades you know um, I'm trying to do my best to you know graduate and make my family proud because because I know for a fact if I don't, you know, graduate on time, my, mainly my father would be like disappointed in me. Like he had, he had all like big, you know, thoughts of me being better of the, of the whole household. But if, yeah, that's why I'm mainly, mainly in like other youth are focused about or worried about. Nicole, you're, um, in fact, I'll have everyone kind of identify this. You're a senior, correct? Yes. At Edison High School. Okay. And how yes. long have you been in youth court, been involved in our youth court program? Uh, two, two years. Okay. All right. Um, so from your perspective then, um, and, and of course, a lot of kids that go through youth court, you know, it's that, that worry added on to everything else, right? Um, Arlie, uh, name the grade you're in and the school that you go to and, uh, and then share your thoughts. Okay, well, I'm a junior at Central High, and I've been at youth court for, this is my third year, actually. And, well, I'm more worried about, like, the opportunities I'm going to have outside of high school, because I've, like, noticed that the volunteering opportunities have definitely diminished, and I need to find things to, like, get involved in, and the community, too. So, that's what I know a few people who are worrying about the same things. Okay. All right. Thank you for your honesty. Lauren. Hi, I'm Lauren. I'm a sophomore 
at Clovis North, and I think youths um, are really worried about school and um, the uncertainty of it coming back, uh, you know, with everything going on, social distancing, keeping up with friends. It's just a really big stress added on to um, everything else in life. Okay. And I know your school district, and I think I saw April uh, here from Clovis Unified, is making some pretty aggressive plans to get back to school. How are you feeling about that? Um, we're going back to school next week. I'm still being online, but I'm worried about, um, you know, cases going up and the safety of our kids. Okay. So that's playing on you big time. Okay, with, with that, and, and what are some of the, we all of us, we talked a little bit about some of the behaviors that youth are engaging in. Um, so let me take it back to, to Nicole. What are some of the behaviors that are, are troubling youth most? Um, and, uh, and maybe speak to maybe some of your friends or, or whoever, things that, that they might be, youth might be getting involved in that may not be all that healthy or healthy, kind of choose either one. Oh, um, sorry. Uh, I didn't like really under like understand. So the um, one of the things with um, Eknor and she's hoping to join uh, expressed that she was really worried about the the substance abuse and and uh, had friends that were you know engaging in you know maybe getting into drugs. She she could, could was concerned that e-cigarettes, for example, is a is a huge concern. Um, do you have any thoughts on the kind of behaviors that youth may be more involved in now than 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 not? Well, right now, like um, I would be like worried about the street life, like meaning like just roaming the streets and like doing things that you're not supposed to be doing at a young age. And okay. it's just it's just like this social distancing is like making it worse and making it more um, open to it. Okay, thank you for sharing that. That's, uh, uh, um, and do you worry about friends that are involved in, in being out at night and, and not being supervised and being where they shouldn't be? Yeah, I really do. Okay. Um, Christina, you're not one of the youth, but I know you work with a lot of youth. Do you have any thoughts on maybe adding to Nicole's concern based on the youth that you work with? Oh, I think Nicole said it well, <laughs> and she's more closer to the youth. Um, I, I'd say looking for ways of belonging and connection. And if we can't do it at school, we might figure out another way of getting that need met. So that can be a concern if it's unhealthy. So. Hey, Lauren, thank you very much, Christina. Lauren, your thoughts? Um, I totally agree with everything Nicole said, um, but I worry that social media is making, you know, the street life like worse. It's putting kids um, in more trouble now that like they're being recorded and they're on social media. Um, and I do worry about their mental health uh, along with the social media and the substance abuse. I think it's very troubling. Okay, thank you for sharing that. And we talked in our group as our, our advisory about the social media. Arlie, your thoughts? I definitely think that social media is like impacted. Um, mental health too. Like I've seen people distance themselves completely. I could say I myself include myself. I mean, I, I include myself in that because I don't know, it's just not the same like between talking to someone and then like distancing yourself. And then I could see why people turn to drugs and I've seen it too. So it's definitely. Okay. Um, so it sounds like all of you feel like just the, a lot of the isolation um, is uh, causing youth uh, and adults um, to maybe get in, involved in habits that they might not normally, might not nor ordinarily be involved in. Um, a third question, and we spent uh, a number of, uh, Christina and Judge Hoff, you were part of this conversation in April, talking about how to talk to youth. And uh, 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 Jermaine, I know you're going to probably have some thoughts along this in your presentation along with James, but um, how, how can adults talk to youth uh, about their worries and their habits? And I will tell you, when we dialogued about this as a youth advisor, we kind of divided the adults into two categories. 
uh, our youth felt like there was one approach for adults who are at the school site to use, and they had some other thoughts about how parents can talk to youth. So, um, so what I'm going to ask um, Arlie and Nicole and Lauren to do is to kind of share your thoughts um, and maybe share your perspective on how uh, adults at school can talk to youth about things that might be going on and how your advice to parents. Arlie, I'll start with I'll start I'll start with you this time. Okay. Well, I'm thinking that so for Central we have a day where we talk about like our mental health and like problems that are going on at home and how we can stay connected. And I think schools can like add some time to focus on actual problems at home besides school because I think they both have to do with each other. Okay. It should be like a breakthrough. Okay, good. Um, Lauren, I'm going to pick on you. I don't know if you know anything about CSI, and I think uh, um, April Mesa is here. Um, how about at Clovis North? What are some thoughts or some maybe some things that are happening there um, to help adults talk with youth? Um, yeah, I definitely agree with what Arlie said, um, where people at the school site need to do as much intervention as the parents. Um, Something that I would want to like help with is that um, the counselors and the teachers and whatever, they can watch people's grades and watch um, how they're attending in class and how they're doing and maybe find some way of checking up on them. Because um, I think the home life and school life are really closely correlated. Okay, probably more so now than ever, right? That's uh... Nicole, your thoughts? Um, I agree with Lauren because like there's a lot um like at our school we make sure that you know every student is getting checked on especially like with the counselors and you know the um with miss kelly the she she really reaches out to every student to make sure everything is okay and like the counselors they make sure that their that their students are meeting their um, graduation points and um just just making sure that they're okay but at home it's like it's hard to like open up to a person over the phone like because you're not there physically to to see their 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 body language to see their their movement it's like it's hard to read a person over um, a phone or over a computer I appreciate you saying that because I think we've been struggling with that very thing uh, in terms of even how to conduct a youth court um, with, you know, having the idea that we don't have people there in person. Um, I know in our youth court program and, and youth can attest to this, we work very hard in terms of our body language and the kinds of questions that we ask and the kind of respect that we show, how we honor that. And it's harder to do that when you can't see your faces or you've got a mask on or you can't hear, right? Um, Okay, the, the uh, next question, um, how can youth courts support youth in and out of sessions? Uh, and again, let's just kind of take it around. Um, and again, we're pretty much been out of session and, and what we're doing in session is, is this kind of thing, but thoughts. And, and uh, again, I'll start with Arlie and then uh, move to um, Lauren and then to Nicole. Um, maybe to help like get to people I think you can send out like emails maybe make some calls and see how like people are doing and check up on them and make sure they're on track because I think that spending like so much time away maybe like influence is good at school instead of bad and you're missing that so I think they should get a touch of what's right you know okay <laughs> all right and Judge Hoffman to be picking on you because this is kind of the area that we, we talked about. That, that's a great idea. We hadn't really thought about that. We could have been doing some of that this year. Uh, thank you, Arlie, for, for sharing that. Uh, Lauren, what are your thoughts? Um, I think that we should work to build, build relationships with, um, with other students, like amongst school groups. And then also furthermore with like administrators and teachers. Um, I think it's really a community thing to support everyone, you know? Okay, very, very good. Um, 
Nicole, your thoughts. Um, I agree with Arlie, right? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, cause like, I mean, we should like the the teachers. They're being appreciated for the things and counselors for always helping us through this pandemic and you know social distancing. But like a lot of students, they like they don't get like appreciated that much. They don't they don't like they don't get known for the hard work that they did that sorry that they have been doing to push themselves to their their highest limits um but like usually like a letter in the mail from from their school would be like a a like a heartwarming thing instead of receiving you know um uh, uh like our report cards in the mail or like you know important information that we should know in the mail like just like getting together and like they could remember that 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 moment that they are being recognized okay appreciate that that's um um yeah those are some things judge hoff uh this is kind of some new these are some new thoughts from the youth what are your thoughts about how some things we could be doing right now just based on what the youth are saying well, keeping an open lines of communication obviously is important. Um, and as noted, virtual meetings are not as good as in person. You don't see people for who they are. You don't see how they're reacting to things very well. You'll tend to find that um, hiding behind a mask and not seeing someone in person really takes a lot away from a conversation. So I think the idea of having some open lines of communication are great. Um, it's key that in that process that the, for example, adults listen and not necessarily just preach, um, to be available and to have an open exchange of thoughts and ideas about issues. Um, and as it relates to the youth court process, if we're not doing the actual cases and processing, we can still be communicating with the students about issues that they're facing, um, keeping that um, dialogue going so that when we do get back into a, a regular mode, if we do, that um, we're addressing issues that are relevant as they relate to offenders. And um, so I think the open lines of communications, anything we can do, if it's not in person, uh, we still have to be available uh, and willing to listen and communicate and that that process should be going on, even though we're not necessarily meeting and having actual hearings taking place. Okay. One of the things that I'm not sure if Arlie or Nicole or Lauren are comfortable sharing, we did a, our youth put together a survey last year and sent that out um, to jurors, to uh, students who were going through the process and it helped us get some insight. I don't know, Lauren or Arlie or Nicole, do you care to speak to that? the value of the survey that we did? Arlie, okay. <laughs> yeah, is it okay? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, well, the surveys were supposedly so we can get insight on what they learned from it. Like the whole process is like, how do I say? It's like up and personal and we wanted to know how these people would feel about how it went through and if they felt like they learned something from it because we wanted to know if it was beneficiary for like for their well-beings and it was more than a process we want to make sure we get a change instead of just um a result or like there's a change in the results but yeah that's why we did the survey well, and i think the um and eknor and and amber i were spoke to this in our meetings about the importance of this being not a punishment, but it's a support. Um, and that kind of goes to the last question. And I see Carolyn's here from uh, Trinity. Um, so Carolyn, uh, feel free to jump in on this. We, the last question is, is, is how youth courts can kind of work together, how they, how they partner. Um, our youth feel very strongly that the punishment, so to speak, the consequences, have to be meaningful. They can't just be, okay, we're gonna write an essay or we're gonna write that. They have to kind of lead to some change. And, and so um, 
the thought was is maybe we can do a better job of that if we share ideas uh, with other youth courts. Uh, Lauren, uh, maybe I'll start with you because you talked about the Key Club that you're involved in and how they uh, work with others. Do you mind sharing that? Uh, yeah, so I'm in this club, it's called Key Club. And every now and then we'll have um, groups of different clubs from different schools all joined together. And we kind of have this like collaborative thing. It's been more recent with like virtual where we're trying to see how each club is doing. And I think it would be really beneficial for the youth courts if we could have um, different schools from, you know, all over California kind of join together and come to like a collective agreement on what we should be doing online, but also how we can work to make, um, make it the, make the, well, not punishments, but make them like work, you know? Okay, good, thank you. Arlie, thoughts? And then Nicole. Um, I actually have a question about that. Um, so would it be like a different type of summit or? Actually, and then a summit is, that's one of the reasons, and Karen can speak to this, that's one of the reasons that we do a summit is to bring youth courts together. And, and uh, but what we haven't done is to have kind of that collaboration. Um, we met with Trinity and kind of agreed that we would kind of set up kind of a mentor court process and uh, to be able to share ideas and, and uh, that would involve youth and, and, and the adults and because we both have steering committees. And so we uh, thought that would be, that would be fun. Um, but yeah, good point. And, and so building on, the, building on the summit to make that something that goes beyond. Um, Nicole, any final thoughts on that? Okay, uh, well, from the consequences and meaning, meaning to the, you know, to the situation at Edison, at every time we have youth court, we and our jurors, we make sure that like, it's something that they should learn from, like to learn from not to do that, to do what they did again. And like to make sure that they realize of what they're doing can um, do some big big situations in the in the future times and like like we just focus on having to making sure that the student understands and like to just make sure that it's like they just open their eyes like they make sure they understand it good well i'm hoping and that's a that's a great segue into uh first introducing uh jermaine jackson um I'm, uh, Jermaine um, has been is with the California Teaching Fellows. He's a life coach. And Jermaine, I think your bio said something like you've reached out to like 40,000 students um, and uh, coaches and parents about kind of developing this next generation of leaders. Uh, mm -hmm. His area of expertise is in the area of social emotional learning. And so with um, Jermaine, you've had a chance to hear from a little bit from the youth. Um, and so at this time, I'd like to turn it over to you for the next 10 minutes or so to kind of talk about your thoughts as it relates to uh, supporting youth and building leaders and, and addressing some of the worries that the youth expressed here over these last few minutes. And then to the youth and to, um, this is a good place to take notes because when we sit down again, I'm hoping that we can, uh, after what we've learned from one another today, uh, take some notes and, and maybe create more um, uh, processes that are what Nicole said that are more meaningful that kind of change that you know kind of change the nature of behavior and outcomes. So Jermaine, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Um, first, I just want to applaud all the students um, answering questions well, speaking well, um, really just kind of stepping up and letting their voice be heard. I think that's amazing. Um, I think every student that spoke today uh, really came across um, clear, really came across like they're, they're, they're passionate about this and they want help, they want change. They want things to, to move in a more positive direction. Uh, and I really felt that from every student um, that spoke today. So I just want to applaud you uh, for being awesome. I want to applaud you for being amazing. Um, but so yes, I, I, I'm gonna just kind of jump kind of right in um, 
everything that was said today that was mentioned, I think is, is right in line with, with what's happening. Our students are hurting. Our students are stressed out and their anxiety levels are through the roof. And at the end of the day, like our students wanna be students and the environment that we're in, it makes it extremely difficult for, for anyone to be productive and to get things done in a way that they know they can. And then we have a, a this large group of students that are crying out for some assistance. And they're crying out for some help. And, 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 and they have, have had it already been difficult, right? We've all been through high school. High school is not easy. Um, making friends is not easy. Playing sports is not easy. Like these things can be all, they're already difficult. So now we throw in this pandemic. Now we put our students on these, these video calls and in classroom and in, on, on video, and it's just hard. So, so what, what I've heard just from today, what I've heard over the last several months from my students, from all the students that, that teaching fellows impacts and touches on a daily basis, the things that we see is our students are in a position, they're in a place where one, I feel students are taking school more serious than they, have, than they ever have before. I think students are showing up to this Zoom call with the intention of, I have to get as much information out of this call and out of this instructor, out of my teacher as I possibly can, because at the end of the day, I'm not getting all the information I need most times. I don't have all the textbooks or the curriculum or the work, or it's just not being explained the way that I need it so I can accomplish the work that I need to accomplish. So then we have students that leave frustrated and we have teachers that leave frustrated. So then what do we do, right, in this, situ in this area that we've been given? How then do we um, become better? And I think a lot of this starts from what I've understood, from, from what I, information I've gathered, is our teachers need more support. Our teachers need more support. So in that return, our teachers then are healthier and they can support our students better. Because I've heard time and time again from students, I mean, students that were straight A students before this pandemic, grades are falling. It's simply because they don't have the instruction that they used to have. Um, you have students that their, their mental health has, has just been hit so hard because they're stuck in the house and they're isolated and they don't have the right people um, to reach out to. And then you have a group of teachers that are just as overwhelmed as everybody else. And there's just not enough brain capacity to go around. So we have people, we have students that are extremely stressed out and they really just don't know where, where to turn. So then there has to be some kind of support that's first put in place for teachers because the teacher, I believe, they're the first ones that the students are turning to that are seeing that are sitting in front of this Zoom call. And then from, from there, um, our students are looking for the support and they're looking for the help and they want to have the conversation. We have students that want to have the conversation about what is going on in the world. What is going on with my education? What is going on with, with my friends that I don't get to see and talk to? And we have not been able to, do, to deliver that healthy conversation with our students. So being able to take a step back and take a good grasp of what is going on and how are we going to not just move forward to this, this, this hope of things will get back to where they're supposed to be, but how do we move through the mud and the mess right now? And all of it comes back to just being able to have this conversation with each other where we're transparent and we all are taking this like fake facade of who we want to be or who we think we are, or, are trying to hold things together when we know we can't. We have to be able to be transparent with each other and have this, this conversation that says, look, things aren't well. 
and things are difficult, but you and I are in this together. And you and I together have to figure out how to help further your education as a student. And as a teacher, it's rough for me. And as a parent, it's rough for me. But in all of that, I'm going to try to do my absolute very best to support you and to help you. And, and, and I think students, students need to hear that real conversation that comes from a teacher or a parent. That real conversation to say, look, I know we are all hurting, but I believe if we work together, we can make this happen. Because what's happening now is teachers and parents, they're kind of just pointing and directing students to do things that they know they can't even really do right now. We're pointing and we're directing students to get this assignment done, to do this and to log on at this time and to get this done, to turn this in. And we're directing students into doing all these different things. And as the, the teacher or as, as the parent giving the direction, you're just as stressed out and confused as they are. So when you are delivering direction and assignment, it's coming across confusing because you're confused delivering it. So I think a lot of times for our teachers and our parents, we have to just drop this, this facade of, I'm the adult, so I know better. So just listen and do it the way I'm telling you to do it. Versus saying, look, no one's been here before. This is messed up, but we can work together to help further your education. I am the teacher and you are the student. And I'm gonna give you the best that I can possibly give you. But in that though, I need you to meet me and I need you to give me your very best. Because in these kinds of moments is really where characters developed and where it's built, right? And where a teacher can truly form a, a, a lifelong relationship with a student in these times where everyone is stressed out and things aren't going well. This is not the time to be the alpha teacher or the alpha parent and just point and direct people to do things versus saying, look, we need to come together. And yes, I am the parent and you are the child. Yes, I am the teacher and you are the student. And I'm gonna give you the direction the best that I can, but I need you to meet me with an open mind so we can work together. And I think really we've just gone away from, even, even before the pandemic, the pandemic just made it worse. We've gone away from just real conversation. We've gone away from just being able to talk, talk with one another, talk with a student or a parent, talking with their child, talking with their son or talking with their daughter and just being able to have a real conversation and allowing yourself to be vulnerable, allowing yourself to allowing yourself to, to be in a position where you don't have to know all the answers or always be right. I think in those times are really when students shut down because students can sense when it's not right. And when we pretend that it is, it just makes things worse versus being able to say, we know things aren't perfect, but us working together, we can figure this out and we can be there for you. So, I mean, the students that are on the call now, just take a quick second, like, is, am I delivering? What I'm saying, does this make sense? Like, is this kind of in a direction where you say, man, if we can move, more in that direction, I think my anxiety and my stress can come down a little bit more and we can communicate and work better with teachers and parents. Students, talk to me, please. I see your heads nodding. You can go ahead. hundred percent. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? I know there's a couple of other students on. I think you're right. We have to work together to move forward. Right. That makes sense. That makes sense. So I think in all of all of this, I mean, teaching fellows, I mean, they're huge and they have a ton of employees that work with a ton of students and where we've found and where we've seen the greatest connection and the greatest impact is in those real conversations with students. It's really being able to set 
job titles aside and set I'm the parent and you're you're the child aside setting all that stuff aside and being able to say like this is how I feel things are difficult how do you feel and how can I help like what that does is that creates a healthy relationship where people can then help each other grow and it's not all about who's right or who's wrong or who made the rules or who broke the rules. It's really about, I believe in you and you believe in me. And although things aren't perfect together, we can be better. Moving in that direction, I believe um, our students' anxiety and stress um, and, and their mental health will all start to become better because they now have someone that they can talk to, they can be real with. And it's not all about why did you fail or why did you fail that test? Why were you late to class? Why is your camera off? Why all these things, right? Instead of that, it's, I just had a rough night. It was just difficult at my house last night, right? Being able to, and I, and I get like not being in person, you, you can't always have that conversation on a Zoom chat with 20 other students. Um, but being able to first create the outlet for teachers to be able to decompress and have someone to talk to. So then they're available and ready to serve the students, but then also being able to have an outlet for students to have that person to talk to and to communicate with. And I think we need to, we need to create more of, of those lines where students have someone that they can talk to and be real with, um, but not just, we cannot, we cannot forget about our, our teachers. Our teachers need more support so that they can support students better because our, our students is who needs the support and it's their teacher that they turn to first, that they see first on the Zoom call, that they're getting their instruction from first. So if we can have whole teachers and they can work better with students on being whole. Does that make sense? Yeah, Jermaine, I, you know, it's funny. I, I, as I'm hearing you talk, the first thing that comes into my mind is some missed opportunities uh, for us with Youth Court. I, I wrote down the, your statement, how do you feel? Um, how can we help? I, I think that's what we wanted to, you know, what we want to accomplish with Youth Court is um, uh, because I don't know how, the, those that are participating in the process um, and jurors, you can speak to this. We hear some pretty vulnerable, you know, some some pretty personal information, some pretty personal things, the things that you shared, Jermaine, uh, are the things that come right from our youth. Um, and uh, so uh, it's, I think you ch have challenged us to figure out how we keep that conversation at a deeper level. And maybe that means more reviews. Maybe that means coming back to the students. Um, Eknor, I saw that you joined and this is kind of, what Jermaine's words were, I think, kind of might have hit a um, chord with you in terms of what you shared. Any any um, takeaways that you'd like to share before we move on to James? Um, I do agree with um, uh, Mr. Jackson that many parents, it would be much easier if they tried to relate to us. I feel like most of us, most of the parents or adults just lecture or um, just um, give us directions as teachers do and then just go on their way while we're stuck here feeling whatever emotion we're feeling maybe anxious or worried and um, as a juror from youth court I noticed that many people um, and many students do drugs because they need to feel um, they want to feel better they don't want to feel the same way that they've been feeling maybe they've been in depression and I feel like if many if more adults were to come up and talk to them um, openly about it, it would make a, a, um, a great bigger of a difference. It looks thank like you. Nicole, Nicole has a hand raised. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Um, I would love to add on to Eknor's um, statement. Like she's like, I could relate to what she's saying because like many parents, they tell their, they tell their, their, their kids that oh what not to do and what to do to get you on this right path because like a lot of like yes kids are going to be anxious about what their parents are telling them and saying like oh you wouldn't 
you can't do this because I've already been through that situation and I don't want you to go down there. But kids are going to be anxious about doing that. They want to be like experiencing, you know, they're just going to be like, oh, what happened? What's going to happen to, uh, what's going to happen to, you know, they're just going to, they're just going to be anxious about, you know, how to go down and like, like, why can't they go through it? Like, I appreciate that, Nicole. And I think that's a good segue to um, uh, James White uh, to really kind of, you know, t talk a little more deeply about the idea of how, how are youth feeling and how do we help? And uh, um, so James, James has been, again, with the California Health Collaborative for six years. Um, he has taken the lead on a really creative uh, project called Reality Tour. Uh, so without any further ado, James, it's all yours. Thank you, Terry. Uh, and thank you, panelists and, and um, co-panelists here. Um, I'm very impressed with all the all you young people out here. Um, it takes a lot just to get onto a meeting like this and to be a part of the organization that you are. And I know you're doing great work just because you're associated with Terry Peretti and we've known her for many years. And um, Jermaine, I have a very soft spot for the teaching fellows. So um, we, we have some of our staff that come from there as well. And, and everybody's good people um, coming from teaching fellows. Um, yeah, I would like to address um, really some of um, what I saw in some of the questions and responses. And then actually, I'd like to share maybe um, um, kind of what Nicole was um, saying and almost everybody else about maybe some techniques that us as parents, teachers, adults can kind of use um, when working with youth and um, in some of those situations where uh, maybe to try and alleviate some of the anxiety that may come from uh, communication with them. Um, safe spaces is a really big part of um, what we've been doing. Um, since the pandemic and trying to be trauma informed and talk a lot about um, adverse childhood experiences and things like that. And really um, a big movement for us has been really, really trying to connect um, mental health and substance abuse. Um, there's always this debate in this um, field, which came first, was it the mental uh, health issue or the drug abuse? What, what was causing what? And really that, that's still up for debate, but the bottom line is that those things work hand in hand. Um, I hear the word anxiety and I hear the word depression and bipolar and things like that. And what we hear is that people that come to substances, often they have those pre-existing mental health conditions beforehand, they're using and those things are still popping up and then they try and quit or aren't able to get the drug anymore. And guess what? The issue still persists, it's still there. Um, it's not being treated. And that's probably one of the biggest things of this whole pandemic has been um, what we're hearing is that those that were having mental health issues um, or those that had underlying or untreated ones, um, things have really spiked and skyrocketed. And that goes right along with substance abuse. All of that stuff um, skyrockets together. Uh, and so what we're kind of trying to do around that is to facilitate safe spaces between adults and youth uh, and trying to be that ourselves. So um, my program, um, Performing Above the High within the California Health Collaborative, we um, focus a lot on um, youth leadership and interaction and that sort of thing. And so um, I actually run a youth coalition with eight other youth um, that are from Clovis North. And um, we work on marijuana prevention. That's the focus of my program. Um, we work on marijuana prevention issues together. And so I'm considered um, what's called their adult ally. And my job is to be there for them to do the work, but also to be a support if possible. Um, and so, by facilitating these safe spaces, whether it's, um, you know, I might not be the safe space for all these students, but I'm there and available if needed. Um, we're also trying to really, um, on the other side of it, when we're presenting to parents, we really want to focus on being able to get them to understand why youth are feeling the way that they are, um, what are some of the problems that exist now. And when you ask them, they're talking about isolation. And um, when you're asking the youth, at least our youth, they're saying boredom. A lot of it is boredom and isolation. Um, and really trying to get everybody on the same page um, is the biggest thing. I think Jermaine spoke a lot about that. So ideally, it gets me thinking as a parent, um, I have two young children, but it gets me thinking as a parent, like, okay, what am I doing to provide a safe space? Do they have online support groups that are healthy that they can go to? Um, are they engaging in any behaviors that maybe um, I need to be aware of? Are they really self-isolating a lot? Am I personally a safe space for them or is my partner? Um, there's lots of different considerations um, related to that. When we had in-person school, um, we'd be asking the same questions about perhaps a teacher or perhaps a counselor or somebody there. 
um, that can be a safe space. Um, safe space can also not just be people, but it can be an actual location or activity. Um, in our work upcoming and hopefully in person one day, um, we're hoping to facilitate groups that are more based in um, artistic expression and self-expression um, so that that can um, really be something that uh, the youth can go to and have that just be their safe space, even if it's for a short while. So there's a lot of different kind of considerations around this um, related to it. And, and it's really been a part of our, our work for a while here now. Uh, I'd like to, if I can, actually just share my screen and you all inspired me to kind of um, bring up a couple of the, maybe the techniques that, um, that we're using um, and having parents, um, like encouraging parents to use with youth. And I'd love to hear um, the young people's opinion on do you think that some of these things are good ideas? Um, I know we've kind of researched and, and been involved in um, making sure that they're all appropriate and um, evidence-based. But um, like, for instance, when we're presenting for parents, we're talking about, um, and, and I'm thinking of Nicole's words right now, of like having anxiety around some kind of interaction with your parent. That, that really kind of hit me inside a little bit because I felt like, oh, I never want that to be the case. I'm a parent and uh, I do this work myself and work with young people all the time, but um, we're encouraging them to be able to set the stage and maybe um, in that way, try and be distraction free away from like devices and phones, pick a time where everybody's not going to be rushing and trying to end the conversation. Um, and this is about like opening up the conversation about drugs and alcohol. Um, like I, I believe it was Nicole and, and one of the other panelists, um, I think Eknor, um, that we're bringing this up to really try and open up the conversation and have an open line of communication like Judge Hoff was talking about earlier. That's really the biggest thing um, that uh, biggest offense a parent has um, when raising a child and attempting to like sort of guide them away from drugs and alcohol. Now, from a parent perspective, that's what you're trying to do. But from a youth perspective, I understand that everybody out there, I think the, the biggest thing is that you don't want to be told what to do. You want to be maybe presented the information about some of this stuff or find it for yourself and be able to make an educated choice. And that's all we really want at, at my organization. We're interested in you all making educated choices about your future, whatever that is, whether it's drugs and alcohol or college or whatever it happens to be. Um, so we talk a lot about um, same thing, um, like not using big body gestures and body language, not physically dominating, standing over, um, having the right tone of voice, um, all kinds of different things. One thing that we've we found also is that conversations in the car are a really good thing because that face-to-face -face, like scheduled time on the couch at home, that can be kind of intimidating to have these open sort of conversations and maybe just casually talking in the car a little bit or when an opportunity presents itself to talk about drugs and alcohol or to talk about mental health or to talk about what's troubling you. Um, that seems like something that really um, can be effective. And then we have some tips for, you know, keeping the conversation going and things like that. But one thing that also stuck out to me and I think is, is a really big deal, and I hope you all would approve of this, is thinking about how things can go better in the future and to, to Jermaine's point, working as a team. So how can we work as a team going forward, not focusing on what's happened in the past so much and things that have already happened that can't change. We're not going to focus on that time when so-and-so experimented or so-and-so was with these people and whatever it is, we want to focus on like, okay, what's the procedure going forward? Because it seems like that's something that I can remember back to my teenage years that if my parents kept bringing up the past or you did this this one time or whatever it is, um, you change a lot at this age and you're able to change and mature quickly sometimes um, and learn from your experiences and move forward. And so that was kind of something that stuck out to me. But I just wanted to share a couple of those things and I hope that they're, they're helpful. And again, that's some of the stuff that we're encouraging our parents to think about and consider um, related substance abuse. But um, I'd love to hear from, from some of the youth about what they think are some safe spaces. Um, what do you all think about some of the techniques that we're teaching to our parents? Um, different things like that. Um, I can go first. I thought the presentation was um, really good. I think it's really um, important that the parents um, you know, really open the conversation, like start it, but also like keep the conversation open. It's not a one-time conversation. It should be continuously um, checking up on your kids, making sure that their behaviors and whatever aren't leading um, towards a dark path of drugs and alcohol. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, absolutely. And a part of that is even, um, I just keep thinking back to what Nicole said, that like anxiety provoking 
you know, interactions with parents is just terrible. But at the same time, these things are going to happen and it's going to be hard. And maybe you have your, your anxiety level elevated here anyways. Um, but it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it's difficult as a parent to kind of, um, I don't know, accept that you're almost like, it, it would be best to accept that you're equal partners um, with your kid, even though you're not necessarily in some other ways, but if you can accept that like they're nearly an adult and um, I'm saying this as a parent really, but like they're really nearly an adult. They've just about got the mind of somebody that can handle a lot of what you can at this stage. And students now are very, very informed about a lot of different things. Um, give them the info, like stop trying to guide and push and force and all those things that provoke anxiety and give them the tools and the information to, to make what you deem good choices and hope that they do, because ultimately we know that people are gonna do what they're gonna do. Like young people are gonna do whatever it is that they're gonna do. They're gonna find a way even in this pandemic. But if you're putting out the information and being open and honest and straightforward, um, that's really what's gonna be successful. James, that's really, really uh, valuable. I, I see Johnny there and, and Johnny, is Isaac with you? No, unfortunately, uh, we okay. were not able to get a hold of Isaac. Okay. We're having a little bit of issues with his uh, tracking him down right now. Okay. I um, And I'm just jumping in here because I had the, the real pleasure of not only having a couple of conversations with Isaac by phone, but he participated with with us as a as the youth advisory and everything that Jermaine said, everything that our youth have said, that James have said, really points to the importance of having being able to connect and and doing it through the high times and the low times. And and uh, uh, and Johnny, I just need to say to you that the, one of the things that Isaac emphasized is the relationship that he had with you as an administrator and that you were a go-to and, and really a, a safety net. Um, so kind of going back to that safe places, I don't think any of us at any point in time, based on the work that we do with youth, um, sometimes we may not, not even know if we're a safe space. So James, you raised the question, you know, I may not be that safe space. Sometimes we may be that safe space and we may not know that, um, you know, that we are that for that, that kid uh, or that youth. So um, I, I think the takeaways for, for youth court um, is one, and, and Jermaine, you kind of set the stage. It's how are we? How, how are you feeling? And how can we help? I think that's what youth court is about. Um, uh, youth court needs to be a, a safe space. Um, communication has to be real. It has to be transparent. And and uh, both Jermaine and, and James, both of you brought out very important points about how intentional that communication has to be. Um, the other thing is youth court can't be intimidating. Um, and it's kind of a it's kind of a scary process, but it can't be intimidating. And and I think that's where the youth come in. I mean, the the judges, you know, Judge Hoff, you're in a in a, a robe now. That's intimidating to kids, but you do such a great job of of kind of taking that down. Um, and then I think the other thing is is moving forward. Um, at the end of the day, that's why we put this process together so that youth can uh, move forward. Um, we have just a couple of minutes. Any any final thoughts? I um, I again want to thank the youth uh, for joining and for I uh, see a lot of our youth uh, our adult advisors here and appreciate that. Um, I will just tell you uh, for us having youth listening to youth having the advisory there has been so powerful to our whole process. Um, uh, we kind of go through the motions sometimes. But hearing you, that causes, you know, should cause us to think more deeply about our processes um, and if they are really as transparent and real and genuine as we, we intend them to be. So any final thoughts from anyone? Comments? I, I have something, Terry. Um, we are life coaches for California Teaching Fellows Foundation and we hire 2,000 mostly first-generation college students. And um, what we find is uh, the life coaching helps draw out their best, you know, helping them be more resourceful, helping them with their grit, helping them um, understand what's inside of them, 
what is in them, what's their values and personality and strengths and goals and drawing that out of them so that they can become successful in life. We have tools that we give them so that they can overcome obstacles. And so, um, you know, we would love to be able to, to then trickle that down to high school students to begin to develop high school students. My colleague here, Adriana, uh, she deals with the professional development side. We deal with the personal development side. And to help people find who they are and find their passions, um, help them understand how to, how to give back. You know, these are some things that we help students discover. And um, I think that there's a lot of potential to be able to um, help some of these students who maybe haven't had that kind of, of training or attention or what we call edutainment. You know, we make it fun, but make it relevant. So um, it used to be where after school programs were just babysitting, you know, making sure everyone was safe and healthy. And then it got a little more academic. And now it looks like it's shifting to build those relationships in that space for communication and uh, begin to draw out the best in these students. So this is great dialogue. And um, I, I, I think that this is going to show what we're made of. And we have the potential to do great things, both on the adult side and on the youth side. So we're, we're excited about being part of that narrative. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, thanks, Pam. And I, I just will end with this and turn it to Sasha. Um, I think uh, one of the, the things is, is we can't really do youth court in isolation. We need our partners. And so again, I really uh, appreciate so very much and thank the youth especially, uh, and, and Jermaine for uh, your comments and teaching fellows and the potential for the partnership. And, and James, for the California Health Collaborative, and I didn't know till I spoke with you that you were already working with teaching fellows. And so uh, I, I look forward to um, our youth courts and there's, and again, Trinity's here. So hopefully we can um, do some more fun things together like this. So Sasha, I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you again, everyone for your time and for joining us and, and uh, really appreciate it very much. Yeah, thank you for a lively conversation. I already put in the chat box the link to uh, fill out an evaluation form. This is really helpful for us to make sure that we're delivering um, useful information to uh, youth courts in California. I'm going to put it in the link in the chat box right now. There it is. If you can click on it, even if you don't have time to fill out an evaluation right now, get it onto your desktop, uh, get it into your browser, and, um, and we look forward to your feedback. We really appreciate that. Um, and I think that's it. We are closed out. So we really appreciate all the panelists and really appreciate Terry Peretti. Thank you so much for moderating a really um, engaging conversation. Yeah, thank you. And thank you colleagues for uh, being here. And, and uh, Kevin, I see I'm trying to, I'm not very good about watching the chat room and watching the all the participants. And so, um, uh, I, we have a, many of our uh, advisory here from our uh, here with the youth, and so um, really, really appreciate that. So um, look forward to more opportunities to engage together. Great, thanks everyone. <laughs>
I don't uh, see it. Uh, well, I'll get your contact information and I'll send it to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right. Thanks. Uh-huh. All right. Bye. Bye.